Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. This is Jordan, the Marketing Coordinator here at AIM. Today's webinar will be recorded and then later posted on our website. This does mean that all attendees will be automatically muted so that we get a quality recording. If you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box and we'll try to answer them throughout the presentation. But if we're unable to get through all the questions, we'll have a member of our marketing team reach out to you individually to make sure you get that answered. We do have webinars every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Next week's webinar is a look at Medicare Madness with lead internal wholesaler Mike Anderson. Everything points towards a crazy AEP period, and Mike will tell you why and how you can prepare and benefit from the madness. And with that, I'll hand it over to Derek so that we can go ahead and get started. Take it away, Derek. Thank you, Jordan, and thank you for everybody for being here. Hopefully you're having a great Tuesday. Uh, as you probably know, since you're here, this is going to be covering final expense in juvenile life. Uh, two products that have really kind of been blowing up lately, if you've been watching the insurance industry, there's a lot of agents out there, you know, writing five plus final expense policies a week. They're just kind of knocking them out. So it's a really good area, whether your focus is on life or maybe you're in the Medicare industry or somewhere else to be able to kind of pivot to and have for both of these policy types, because they are very simplistic and we'll kind of jump into the benefits of both of them here as we're going through this presentation. All right, so to start off with, I obviously got some fun little facts. We're not going to dive into each one of these. Some of them you can read, but one thing to kind of note is one of the top reasons for consumers buying you know, any kind of life insurance is to cover burial or other final expenses, which is when we're talking about final expense insurance, you know, the main thing it covers. That's what most people get it for. So that's kind of a good thing to take note of that there is a big market for this out there. Um, the senior market, which is mainly who that's going to be focused towards, is growing every day and it's going to continue to do so for, you know, about another decade, give or take. So it's a very kind of nice niche or part of the life industry that people can get into. That's very simplistic. Um, on the right side there on those kind of little yellow graphs are the top reasons people don't buy life insurance, right? Number one, too expensive. I'm sure all of you have run into that, you know, throughout your careers on many different products, right? But especially life insurance. Um, kind of tied into that is other financial priorities, so I don't want to buy this because it's too expensive. I got other stuff, right? Or they're not really sure how much they need. And obviously, this is where you come in as an agent. But when it comes to both of these life insurance policies that we're going to get into, they're not very big benefit amounts. So that kind of takes out some of that unsurety just by itself, right? We're talking about a difference between... 20,000 or 50,000 instead of 100,000 versus a million or 2 million, right? So there's a lot less to work with. It simplifies the whole process quite a bit, which is really good for both the agent and the consumer. Something else to just keep note of, since we are talking about final expense for part of this, is the average ages of death, right? So 73 for males, 79 for females in the U.S. So there's a good chance that most people are going to need this around that age or not too long after that. Um, if they make it past those ages, well, then it's probably, you know, an increased likelihood that something's going to happen. Also, it's really important to note that a lot of people used to say, I don't really need this or I don't need much money for when I pass, right? I'm just going to be cremated. That's not necessarily the cost saving kind of route or alternative that it used to be not too long ago. As you can see, getting a cremation's about the same as getting a lower end funeral. So you're not really gonna be saving much money going that route. So if that's someone's backup plan, probably not the best option for them. They're still gonna need some money to cover, right, their final expenses, whether that's gonna be the cremation or actually getting buried. So it's a really kind of nice thing to note in the back of your head are those statistics for whenever you are having these talks. Um, one, it helps you seem a little bit more knowledgeable in the area. Two, it makes it a little bit easier to position the product to be able to sell it, which is, you know, besides taking care of the customer, what we're trying to do as agents, right? 
going a little bit more into final expense, there's a few things to note, right? So whether you know all about them or for some of you guys are new to this, I'm gonna try and cover a little bit of both for everything. So that way everyone kind of walks away with hopefully something they learn from this or they can take away and use down the road. But when it comes to building final expense, even though it's a very simplified or simplistic product, I kind of like to take each one case by case. And what I mean by that is when I get a client and you're gathering the information, I'm not going to always jump straight to guaranteed issue final expense. Part of the reason for that is those are usually a little bit higher on the premium side. Yes, we're talking about low premiums to start off with anyway, but it is a little bit more attractive, obviously, if you can save them some money like we talked about. That's one of the number one reasons people don't get life insurance is because it's too expensive. So we're already starting off at a really good spot. Even if you get the guaranteed issue, it's still pretty inexpensive. But why not try and get it a little bit cheaper if there's no medical reasons or issues that are gonna keep them from going through the underwritten route. Also, if we do go that way, we are still talking about final expense policies. The carrier already is taking into account that most of the people buying this are going to have some health issues. They're probably going to be a little bit older. So that's already kind of built in there. And with that, it's going to be very simplistic underwriting or health questions. It's not going to go super in depth and dive into everything like some of the other life policies do. So still very simple. Um, or, you know, if I have a client who does have some pretty big kind of exclusions for getting anything through underwriting okay well then we'll jump straight to that you know guaranteed issue so i kind of like to take it case by case um obviously there's not as much to rework and build as if you were doing like a index universal life policy or iul but there still are some differences when you're building the product having said that most final expense policies are going to be similar in the way they're built they're going to be similar in the pricing, right? They're all in the same ballpark. There's not going to be one that is completely night and day different. And if so, it's going to be reflected in the pricing and different things like that that'll work in there. So it kind of helps level the playing field when you're there. Um, there are some differences. Obviously, they're not all built completely equal. So it's important to note those. And we'll get into a couple of them just kind of so you have an idea of what I'm talking about when I say that. Um, some of them are main, sorry, usually going to have, you know, an accelerated death benefit built in there for terminal illness. While that is a cool feature, remember we're not talking about huge benefit amounts. So if someone has a $10,000 death benefit for their final expense and they get 80% of that, they're going to get $8,000, right? It's not going to be really enough to go try and do experimental treatment or whatever the case is, but what they can do is if they're still feeling healthy enough and they don't want to have their loved one, you know, who is also dealing with the shock of the fact that they just got diagnosed with a terminal illness and they're going to pass soon and they don't want them to have to go set up everything after they die, right, because they're already dealing with enough, they can go ahead and get that set up and in place beforehand. They can get all the funeral arrangements paid for and taken care of and planned out. Um, so it's kind of a nice thing to help ease the burden on the loved ones you're leaving behind. So it is a good benefit. As far as them all not being built the same when it comes to final expense, one key area to take note of is going to be graded versus level death benefit. And basically what that is, is just what it's saying. If you have a level death benefit, it's going to stay, let's say we have it at 20,000. It's going to stay at 20,000 the whole time, starting from day one. If you have a graded death benefit, and there's a couple different ways they do this, um, it can be year one, you're going to get your premiums back for what you paid into it if you pass away. And then year two, maybe you get 50% of the benefit. And then year three, you get 100%. Um, that's not a, you know, verified number of figures. It changes a little bit based off the carrier right, exactly what they have, but it's a simplistic way to kind of explain the differences between the two. So it's something to kind of look out for when you are writing these. Graded benefits are usually going to be a little bit cheaper because they're not going to be paying that full amount for the death benefit, you know, the first one, two, three years, but it's not going to be a very 
you know, large difference as far as premium because most of these are going to be pretty inexpensive. So this is going to be a whole life policy, meaning it is permanent. There's not going to be rate increases. Um, it doesn't matter what your health does down the road, right? They're going to be locked in at that price, which is kind of nice. And then also kind of going back into that, they're not all built the same. They're going to have some different riders. They're going to have some different perks, benefits, things like that that are kind of nice. So it's something to look at, like I was saying, on a case-by-case -case basis. Something that they offer as a perk or a rider may kind of be more beneficial or eye-opening or catching to a certain client. All right, so diving into some examples and kind of some differences and some key points. Obviously, on the left side is going to be an example of a guaranteed issue. So between the ages of 50 and 80, you can't get turned down, right? Everybody's going to be able to get it. It's going to be fairly inexpensive. So if we're talking about a $10,000 death benefit for a 60-year-old male, you're looking at about $63 a month. Now, some of you who do quite a bit of life are thinking, well, that's not too cheap. I just did a million dollars for a 25-year-old, you know, a term policy, right? Well, you got to remember the age range we're talking about. So one, a lot of these people aren't even going to be able to get like a 30-year term if they're 60 or 70 years old. Two, if they go out and get a 10-year term or a 15 or a 20, it's going to be a lot more expensive right? Yes, it's a bigger death benefit, but they may not need that because at this point in their life, hopefully they have the mortgage paid off. Hopefully their cars are paid off. They're not worried about replacing an income because they're on social security or their retirement, right? They're just worried about protecting some money to cover final expenses. So guaranteed issue, pretty simplistic. Um, they're going to get through Pricing is going to be a tiny bit higher because it's guaranteed issue. They're going to let everybody through. On the right is kind of a simplified issue, so to speak. Um, even though final expense is pretty simplified by itself, there are some carriers who, for certain age ranges, make it even easier. Basically, you apply for this, and then based off of what your rating is, they're going to give you different max base amounts that you're able to get. So it's kind of a middle ground between the full underwriting for final expense and the guaranteed issue. On the left, kind of a version of the living promise. This one's a little bit outdated. It actually goes up to 50,000, depending on your state. For final expense, um, on the columns there in the middle, you have basically the level benefit. And then on the right, you have the graded benefit. So we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier. Still going to be very inexpensive, going to be cheaper than guaranteed issues because they are going through more health questions, right? There could be some underwriting based off what they answer. It's just kind of the full range of guaranteed issue to going through the underwriting steps. Um, as far as carriers, we do have quite a few. There's a lot of different options out there. One easy way to really do it is to just give us a call. And we can kind of point you in the right direction for whatever client you're working for on that case. As far as some of those perks and kind of fun benefits we were talking about, um, on this right is one of GTL's products. Uh, they have their Sequoia coverage, depending on what state you're in. As you can kind of see, they have a lot of checks compared to some of their competitors. Um, basically, with that, some of this is going to be attractive to some of your clients. Some of it won't be. So things like international assistance, if someone passes when you're you know, in a different country, emotional support. Now with that, that doesn't mean that GTL is gonna necessarily do all of this. Some of this, they will direct you to companies that do it for you. So things like domestic shipping assistance, right? They're gonna kind of get you in touch with the people that do it which is nice because instead of having your client who's 80 years old, who just had their spouse pass away, try and jump on Google and find who's a real place to be able to ship, you know, their spouse to their home state because they were out visiting people. They can call in, 
they're going to get them to a verified trusted source to be able to ship their loved ones. So it's kind of a nice perk to have. Um, every carrier and product is going to have some kind of different stuff they work in there. So it's going to be a little bit case like case, case by case, like I was saying, where some of this stuff may, you know, really attract the client and some of it may be just 100% price. So it's good to have different options and kind of look through them. And that's really where we can come in and kind of be like, yeah, this is what you want. So jumping into juvenile, a little bit of a transition. And then we're going to go back at the end of this and kind of get into a little bit of marketing, uh, positioning the products, you know, different things like that. But jumping into juvenile, it's going to be similar that it is a whole life policy, right? Which means it's permanent coverage. They're going to have those locked in rates. Um, there are some asterisks to that, which we'll get into. It's going to grow some cash value, but you know, really minimal, not really what you're getting into these policies for. Really low premiums, very, very easy underwriting, right? So a lot of similarities between the two products. Um, where this is going to be different, obviously, juvenile policies. So we're talking about kids, right? The nice thing with this, besides everything we just mentioned, is that coverage is going to be locked in regardless of health changes. So for people, you know, who've been around for a little while, who've seen how hard it is to be able to go out and get cheap insurance later or even qualify. I mean, I'm only 38 years old and I don't qualify for any long-term care or a lot of different health life policies out there just because of what I've put my body through throughout the years with football and the army. But it's something where I wish I would have kept something in place, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So a lot of us who are, you know, been around a little while or longer on this earth, we're looking at the fact that it would have been cool if we had one of these set up that were in place that have been there consistently, right? As most things in life kind of goes, there are some pros and cons. These aren't really cons, these are kind of what we expect, but basically the benefits aren't as generous as if you're talking about an IUL or just a normal whole life policy. Um, it's really not gonna be much cash value growth at all because we're you know, putting in five to 20, maybe 30 bucks a month, right? Depending on what you're getting as far as the benefit. Um, so when you're putting in $5 a month, there's not going to be too much growth on that, even over you know, 20 years. And not all policies are created equally. So this is a good point to kind of look at when you're choosing a juvenile policy. Some of them will have you pay throughout the life of the policy. Some of them will have you pay until age 18 to 21, whenever the kid takes over, and then there are no more premiums to pay. Um, some of them will have you, you know, at least the option to reduce the benefit amount for no premium later on. So these are kind of important things to take into consideration based off the carrier when we're getting into them, depending on what the client is hoping to do with this policy. Uh, one place where these are really popular right now is grandparents buying them for grandchildren as kind of gifts and then paying them for, you know, 18, 20 years until the grandchild takes over which is kind of a cool gift like I said I wish I would have had it because most of these do have some kind of guaranteed insurability you know or buy up option whatever you want to call it where they can increase the death benefit amounts at different intervals throughout the life of the policy as far as the design of these and kind of what they look like here's a good example so for this one we're paying about $19 a month for a one-year-old male. And as you can see, kind of in that second to the right column on the far end there, not much cash value like we were talking about. So if their goal is to build cash value, if they're trying to turn this into a 529 college savings plan, right, which maybe they saw on the internet that that's a good thing to do with certain types of life insurance, which it is, but this isn't the policy I would go for. Right, this isn't what you're going to use to try and get some good cash value in there. Something else that's important to note, and usually not what I use as a selling kind of benefit, but it is still important. 
most people don't want to think about their children passing away. Luckily, in today's you know society where we live here, it's not very common. But this is still a life policy. So if something was to happen to their child, they don't have to worry about how they're going to fund a funeral and getting stuff ready. Um, if they're going to have to borrow from their 401k on top of losing their kid, right? It's going to be something that's going to have the death benefit that's going to pay to cover those expenses. So important thing to kind of note, maybe bring up, but I wouldn't use that as the main selling benefit. Obviously, there's a lot of other things that, that make this attractive without having to kind of get into that side of it. Um, but as you can see here, these premiums go up to your 21 and then they cut off, right? So kind of a cool policy. This person's going to have $50,000. They're not going to have to pay it when they take it over. As far as the death benefit, sorry, not $50,000 cash. Uh, as far as different builds not being equal, kind of all that that comes into play with juvenile policies are going to be, like I said, those different kind of buy-up options or guaranteed insurability. They vary carrier to carrier, but most of them usually give you at least one to five different options. A lot of the common ones are going to be if someone you know has a child, if they get married, if they purchase a house, that will give them the option to up their benefit. Now with that, and like I said earlier with the asterisk, depending on the carrier and what the option is for and when this is increased, there is gonna be either a premium increase if they're still paying or they will start a new premium again. But the plus side to this is they're not gonna have to go through underwriting. They're not gonna have to answer health questions, right? It's just something that they're gonna be able to say, yes, I wanna do this. I wanna increase my death benefit for you know X amount of dollars or no, I don't. Um, on the right side is gonna be the Gerber Grow Up Plan. So once the child hits age 18, so let's say they had a $50,000 benefit, that coverage is gonna double. So whatever they had for the benefit, it will double at age 18. So in this case, 50,000 to 100,000, right? And there is no premium increase for that one, which is kind of nice. So they're gonna have $100,000, right, for their benefit once they hit 18 and moving on. And this scenario they kind of built for us, they also chose to do another 100,000 increase at age 21. They did it again when they got married. They did it again when they had a kid, and they did it again at age 40, right? So now they're up to a $500,000 whole life, you know, life policy that they're going to have the rest of their lives by age 40, and it's probably going to be a quarter of the cost of what it would have been had they went out and bought, you know, a $500,000 whole life policy at age 40 when they really need it. So it's kind of a cool way to keep building life insurance. They're not just stuck at that super low you know, benefit. Um, but as I mentioned, every carrier, every policy is a little bit different. So if you're kind of curious, okay, who has these benefits? Which ones are the best? Like I said earlier, if that's where we come in, give us a call. We can kind of direct you towards what's really going to fit for what you have. All right. The fun part. So as far as marketing and selling, some of you guys are in just life insurance. Probably don't look too much at final expense or juvenile policies, which is a little bit of a shame because they are so simplistic. They so are so easy to sell. As we talked about earlier, the senior market is now a huge percentage of our population, and it's going to continue to be that. And as you probably know, if you're selling a lot of life insurance, it's hard to get you know, a 60 to 80 year old person in IUL, that's gonna be cost effective. It's hard to get them a whole life. It's hard to get them a term, right? Really all there is, is final expense. And it's very simple, it's very easy to do. Um, the commission sides of it can be pretty attractive even though they're not huge benefits. Usually they pay pretty good percentages. So it's an easy thing to get into when you have older clientele. On the Medicare side, right, you have a large book, hopefully, of people that you have been selling, right, MedSups, MedAdvantage, whatever the case is, that you know, hey, 
all these clients are perfectly in that age range for this. And it's something that you can just work into as far as a pivot when you're kind of doing the review of, you know, what to expect for next AEP or rate increases are going to this. And it's something where you can just kind of get into it of, you know, do you have any life insurance, right? It could be that simple, or it could be, I want to make sure that you're not going to have to dip into your 401k or that you're set up for this, or, you know, there's a lot of different avenues and approaches to go through it, but really it is just as simple as asking and seeing how they're set up because a lot of these people are not going to have life insurance because they were on term policies throughout most of their life. And as we all know, once that term's up, those prices keep going up and up and up, and it's something that they kind of just let go away because they didn't have all that debt that they needed to protect the person from. They weren't worried about losing a second income because they're on retirement now. So they kind of let those policies go away, but then as they're getting older, they start thinking about the fact, okay, funerals are getting really expensive. It would be nice if she didn't, you know, he, she, whoever their spouse is, didn't have to come up with this out of her pocket. So that pivot's pretty easy. It's a pretty thing to get into, um, as well as doing the same thing for juvenile policies with that fade age demographic, right? As these people are looking at, you know, oh, wow, my only option is only final expense. And yeah, it's not very expensive, but it's not a very big benefit. It'd be cool if I had had something else, right? You can bring up the idea of a lot of grandparents are gifting this to their grandchildren. Um, there are some carriers who let you add up to five, you know, grandchildren or children on one app. Um, one nice thing for the agent is, let's say they have those grandkids in Washington, Texas, Nevada, Idaho, Montana, and New York, right? You don't have to be licensed in all those states. You just have to have the grandparent or the parent, whoever's buying it, be in your state. So it's kind of cool that you can do it all over, which makes it easy. Also, when it comes to marketing and selling, as everybody knows, the internet and social media presence is is honestly a must, depending on how big you're trying to get and how much you want to push this. Um, popping up when people are Google searching, different kind of media outlets as far as the social media where you're going to have a presence that they're going to see you and be calling. Um, one nice thing with final expense is it is a senior market, so things like postcards or mailers can still work. They're still reading them. Community presentations or informational presentations, whatever you want to call them, are huge. If you get out there and you go to some of the senior communities, as far as like the housing developments where it's just seniors only, and you talk to the main office and be like, hey, I would really love this to give an informational presentation on, you know, X right, final expense policies. A lot of times they're gonna say yes, and you can get a pretty good, decent number of people to show up, right, is you just hang some flyers around there and stuff like that, or ask them if you can leave them in the office and present them in a little center, and you'll have some people show up, and a lot of them are gonna have questions after, and you set up appointments, and then you sell from there, and you get referrals, which is gonna be another huge marketing, and honestly, your best return on investment and closing rate is referrals. Always asking for those referrals, making sure like, hey, is there anybody else that you think would benefit from this conversation? Uh, getting into leads, that's <laughs> something I get from just about every agent. Should I buy leads? It's really up to you. It's gonna be one of those things where even if you're buying the most expensive leads, sometimes they're not gonna be the greatest return on investment. Sometimes they are. We do have different options as far as being able to buy leads. So ask us if you're interested in that. Um, I've seen agents make them work. They go completely off of leads. I've seen agents start off with leads and then get into referrals and pivoting and cross-selling a bit more as they go along. And I've seen some agents who just swear off leads altogether. So they're definitely an avenue to use. They can work. But one downside is you do need to have money to buy them to start. So something to consider. As far as that kind of internet and social media presence we were talking about, even with older generations, whether it's, you know, the baby boomer generation or wherever, right? The internet 
social media, you know, just Google searching, <clears throat> excuse me, has worked its way throughout all generations. We're at a point where maybe it's not their favorite avenue, but they know how to use it. They use it quite a bit. And it's something to still remember as an agent, right? Even if you're kind of like, I don't really want to get on social media. I don't want to do this. People are using it. And it's not just the younger generations anymore. Everyone is using it for something. It's kind of been either embraced or forced upon all of us, you know, throughout the years. And when you look at certain kind of demographics and studies, about half the people who get on there and research these things are still going to want to talk to an agent. They're still going to want to actually buy it from an agent. So just because they're going out there and looking, doesn't mean they're just going to buy these online. So it's one nice thing that we're, if they're searching or looking at different things, or you're putting out some marketing on Facebook or wherever, and they see your face, they're still probably going to call you after and talk about it. And you'll still get that face to face and still be able to sit down and go through everything. But having that presence is huge because a lot of people are using it. Most people are doing research on there. They're looking at different things. And when you look at, I would not use the internet at all at the bottom, right? Even the baby boomer generation, <clears throat> which is going to kind of be the oldest out of all of these, is only 20% rounding up, right? Not going to use the internet at all. So 81% of them would use the internet to go kind of find some facts or resources or look for an agent or, you know, whatever the case is, right? But they're going to go online to look for it. So it's kind of important to know, uh, as I did mention, obviously you can't get away with mailers and different things like that. It becomes kind of less and less as far as your return on investment as you go down through age demographics. Um, once you start kind of hitting millennials and Gen Z or younger, a lot of them aren't opening their mail, right? They're, they're not going through everything. They're not looking at it unless it's something they're expecting and they know what it is. Right, they're just going to throw it in the trash. So something to keep in mind for those kind of aspects as far as what you want to push as far as the marketing. Your best avenue, honestly, is going to be referrals or those cross-selling. It's something that you don't have to put a lot of time into these policies because they are so simple. Right, They're so inexpensive. They are very easy add-on items. It's not like you're getting into an IUL and building it to get around taxes as an investment and you have to have all these moving parts and make sure everything makes sense, right? It's very simple. You know, do you have any plans, you know, should you pass away as far as your funeral? Yeah, I'm going to get cremated. Okay, so you know that runs about six, $7,000 right now. I have this awesome final expense policy that we can get you for $10,000. That's $40 a month, right? something easy, simple to put on there. It's inexpensive. A lot of people really aren't going to, you know, shake their head when you say I can get you this for 20, 30, $40 a month. That's a low enough price point that a lot of people are going to jump on that pretty quickly, especially when it's very limited underwriting or no underwriting, right? For the guaranteed issues. Um, and then on the flip side for those juveniles, same thing, but even cheaper. Right, you can get them for five, eight, 10, 20 bucks a month. So it's kind of a nice thing, and you're setting those children up to have life insurance in place for the rest of their lives. As far as carriers, I mentioned we got a lot of them. Um, some of these do both final expense and juvenile. Some of them only have one of the products. They're all pretty similar, like I said, but there are some important key differences. I don't want to list out each one because quite honestly, that'd be very tedious for all you to sit here and just look at the little minute details of every policy. Uh, the easiest way to really do that is, like I said, give us a call, shoot us an email for the kind of case you have or really what you're just looking for uh, as far as is a policy type, whether it's you know final expense or juvenile and we can point you to the right one or two and, and just really be able to get you to set up to hit the ground running and sell these like crazy. As I mentioned, we have a lot of agents who 
and it's not even their main product. It's just something they're either pivoting to or doing on the side. We're pushing out, you know, five final expenses with a few juveniles a week, uh, and on top of what they do, you know, for their Medicare side. And they do carry pretty attractive commissions structures for the agents. I'm not going to list that here because it does vary product by product, state to state. So that's an easy way to uh, speak on something. But basically, wide suite of options as far as carriers, uh, even though we're only talking about the two different products. And this is something that, you know, quite honestly sells itself. Most people are looking to cover those final expenses. Most people are looking to obviously set their children or grandchildren up, you know, with, with something that they can no longer get, right? They've seen what it's like later in life and they wish they would have had it. Um, it's something that is very inexpensive or at least relatively inexpensive to just about everybody you ask. Most people in today's world, when you're talking about five to 50 bucks a month, it's not gonna be make or break, even for those who are on, you know, their retirement, they're on social security. It's something they can get to cover these, which is nice. And they're not gonna be placing a burden on the loved ones they leave behind. So that's kind of a general overview of everything. There are some more kind of pretty specific questions, so we'll just get to those as we're doing our follow-up calls at the end of this. As far as anything that you know, we didn't address in this, because like I said, I didn't want to get too into the weeds on just the minute details of how everything differs, uh, feel free to ask us when we reach out after or give us a call. But that's kind of a quick, you know, overview of the final expense, the juvenile policies, it gives you a glimpse into why these are becoming so popular and why they're so easy to sell, right? We're talking about, you know, coming up with a solution for a need of the client and it's relatively inexpensive. So it's it's a really easy product to sell in position. But I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for being here. And we will be reaching out after this. If you have any questions, about anything else that was addressed in this, feel free to give us a call at the number listed right there. But other than that, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.